Hello and welcome to the MGEV podcast streaming live on Monday the 16th of May 2022. We're here to talk about all the MG electric vehicles and hoping to inform and entertain you for about an hour or so. I'm Barry Hager, Barry H on the forum, and joining us this week are Jake. Hey, evening everybody, my name's Jake Newis, I'm MG ZSEV West Yorkshire, quite a long name. <laughs> <laughs> and, nice and Michael. Uh, hi, uh, um, my username on the forum is Fishy to be. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. And Vince. Hi, I'm uh, Vince31 on the forum. I've been on there for a couple of years now. Welcome. And um, of course, from Chorley Group MG England Innovations Development Manager, what a title, Mike. Uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, uh, Miles Roberts. Hi, everyone. Miles Roberts, CG on the forum. Okay, right. So if you're uh, watching live, thank you for joining us and, and please click the like button and join in the discussion on the chat window. If you're watching us later, then thank you for choosing to watch the video and please subscribe and get notifications when we next go live. So tonight's podcast, we are looking at a number of really interesting topics. We're comparing the new refreshed ZFs EV with the original. We're looking at what features might have attracted uh, you to it and what's been most impressed. And we've got some uh, owners of the new uh, ZS EV on tonight. And then we'll have an update on last year's ZS long range order delivery dates. We look at the stock position that there are on any of the ZS standard range that have recently landed and have a discussion if we've got time on the uh, rapid charger contention issues and software updates for rapid charging. So um, I'd like to now just uh, ask uh, perhaps if Jake, if you could introduce yourself and uh, tell us uh, what car you've got and how long you've had it. Yeah, certainly. So I live in uh, West Yorkshire, quite a hilly area. Um, I've had a two year old Mark one, uh, which my wife has inherited last Tuesday. I picked up my um, Mark II facelift last Tuesday from Burnley Group, uh, Charlie Group, MG. Uh, great okay. service, et cetera. And basically the car I've had for six days. Um, done about 200 miles since I've had it. Um, continued to work at home. Um, but I've learned quite a bit. Vince on the call this evening has had it a little bit longer than me. So I've been helping. Vince has been helping me sort of find out a few hints and tips, as has Miles as well. So... Yeah, the group, the forum is always a good place to start, I find. Okay, thank you very much for that, Jake. Uh, Vince, could you perhaps uh, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and your car? Okay, um, I'm uh, married with uh, uh, children who have left the home now, so uh, I've got grandchildren. I live in Swindon, and uh, my regular long trips are from Swindon to North Wales. First bought the Mark I ZS uh, EV, um, over two and a half years ago now. So when it first came out, really enjoyed it, loved it, never going back to an ice car, just loved the whole EV experience. Had a PHEV before that, an Outlander, but um, hated it when the engine cut in and moved to the ZS EV. So when the new long range came out, it was 180 miles to Wales. So I always had to stop halfway and top it up and uh, top it up again in Wales and top it up again on the way back, etc. So when the long range was announced, I thought I'll pop down, get that, get my name on the list, have a test drive, convince the missus. Um, and that was back in November last year. So we've had ours. Ours was delivered one of the first ones. So we got ours on the 25th of March this year. So we've, um, I've done a couple of trips to Wales since then. And uh, we really love the car. I think the car is fantastic. Yes, it did. It did have the rapid charge problem. We'll come to that later. But that's been fixed now, and it's the car's fantastic. I just love it. Yeah, I would. Right. Agree. So, Jake, I mean, obviously, two hundred miles. You've not necessarily had the uh, full experience of draining the battery yet, perhaps. No, not at all. Well, to be honest, Barry, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm using um, on the infotainment system, um, which is to me one of the benefits <laughs> of the upgrade. Um, you, this health bar on reader on the on the screen. So between forty. 
and 80% is the healthy area to keep your battery within. So if I'm dropping down to say 45% or 40, 40 50%, I, what I like about this version of the car is I plug it into my Zappi at home, um, which I have the five hours um, go faster tariff from half past eight in the evening, and the car stops charging when it reaches 80%. Um, only will I ever wear because I'm going on holiday in Wales not in August, North Wales again, funnily enough. We all seem to go there. Um, my journey from West Yorkshire is around 165 miles. So I had the same problem that Vince had in my Mark 1. This Mark 2 will, will get rid of that and I'll just charge it up to 100 percent At the moment, it, on my app, it's saying 80%, 214 miles. Um, so you know that's mm. it. So I should easily achieve in summer the, the WLTP, if not more, to be honest. I got I got better than I expected, to be quite honest. Uh, when I left so Swindon to my mum's house in North Wales is 180 miles. I went at Easter, so just after getting the car, a couple of weeks after getting the car, where well, I drove up there, 180 miles, got all the way there. Um, I had 38% SOC battery left and 100 miles left on the range. So, you know, uh, an estimated 280 miles. The outside air temperature was seven degrees. And I got four kilowatt, four miles per kilowatt hour. I was really impressed with that, to be quite honest. Yeah, definite uh, improvement um, in my eyes. I've got a long list in front of me. I don't really want to read through everything, but <laughs> there's, a, there's a few things that I do like. And um, I've posted a few on the forum and on the Facebook group. The vehicle to load option is absolutely amazing because... You, you can go, I mean, I know a lot of people joke about when would you use it, but I know somebody who bought it to as part of their trade and their job, they can be out in location now and they've got a, a battery bank of 70 kilowatts. They can plug a chainsaw in, they can plug a, a you know, kettle in, you know, um, as I did on the video that I posted, um, just as a bit of a joke in the garden, having a cup of tea, Yorkshire tea. So, you know, and it, it does say in the manual, I know Miles has uh, quoted this around 2.2, 2.3 kilowatts, but I know my kettle was running longer than that. I don't wouldn't want to do it for a long period of time, but it does actually um, allow you to power something higher than that, up to three kilowatts, if not a little bit more. Um, I did some tin wraps on mine, um, as you probably can see on the picture in the background, um, a local uh, tin and wrap company. Um, I just wrapped the lower door sills. So on yours, Barry, in the background, you can see the silver door trim. Yeah. Um, my Mark One on my Mark One and Mark Two, I've I've just wrapped that in in sort of a, a vinyl um, that looks a bit like the plastic trim. Um, just gives it a bit of uniqueness. That's just my look. I've put a, um, um, a smaller aerial on, which just gives it um, that shark fin look because I don't particularly like the long aerial on it. These are just to me improvements that I've made. Yeah, I I sorry, go on, Barry. I tried the uh, shorter aerial. Uh, because there, I know there was with mine because there was on the forum um, some discussion about um, getting a, uh, the shorter aerial. So I ordered up the shorter aerial, put it on, and what was happening was I kept dropping out of DAB and back into into FM mode all the time. Okay. So it didn't work for me. Um, well, I'll be honest, I, it, that's happened a couple of times, but it tends to be in the dips and the troughs. You know, if you've got high hills around, I, I find that anyway happens. Mm on the longer aerial. So it, it doesn't really affect it that too much. And the only thing I would say on the infotainment system that I had to reach out to Vince on that, that I couldn't get my head around was something called dead reckoning, which is um, a setting of yeah. standard MG settings on the infotainment system, which apparently is supposed to be something that when the car is left on, it kind of reads the um, speed and direction of the car if you're going through a tunnel. But at the moment, for some mm. reason, the... The, the software on the infotainment system doesn't work. So you have to turn the dead reckoning off so that the um, arrow on the sat nav follows the car around. Um, and Vince very kindly helped me out on that one. It's certainly we've, um, we've put a request into MG about that because there's a, um, there is an update for the uh, non-connect versions of the um, ZS, which uh, fixes that, but there doesn't appear to be for the connect versions at the moment. So okay. Uh, yeah, the work the workaround at the moment is to turn off dead reckoning, but um, we're looking at MG to try and see what's gone wrong there. Because so there is a software update for the other cars. Yeah, yeah. Um, just some other things: mud flaps. I bought some Mark One ZS mud flaps for the car. Um, the contouring of the rear bumper is rounded on the new ZS, the facelift, whereas on the rear of the Mark One, it's slightly squared or um, angled slightly. 
but I fit them and they're, they're absolutely adequate for purpose. The front ones match identically. The rear ones are just slightly out, but to me, they're, they're absolutely fine. Um, uh, and, and that's around it, really, to be honest, in, in terms of the updates um, in regards to what I've done. Um, a few LED lights that came with incandescent bulbs I've put in, so I put a boot light in. I'm planning on putting rear lights in, which I did on my Mark 1, um, and some rear reversing lights as well, and I think there's some, some other lights which I plan to do as well, or the uh, number plate bulbs to replace the incandescent number plate bulbs to LEDs as well. So those are just a few things that I've done. I've done about you, Vince. What have you yeah, um, well, certainly after driving the Mark One around for two years and then just jumping in the, the new facelift version, I noticed a few differences. The first thing was reading the manual. I read the manual all the way through. I'm a manual guy. I do read all the manuals all the way through. One of the first things I noticed, which I've not seen in any of the reviews on YouTube or anywhere else, was that the 12 volt battery is always monitored, even when the car is switched off and parked. The 12 volt battery is monitored and it will be topped up by the HV uh, high voltage battery automatically. Now, that's something completely different. That doesn't happen in the Mark I. Um, mm. So, in theory, we shouldn't get any flat 12 volt batteries. Um, but obviously, it only works within set parameters. If your HV battery is too low, of course, it won't do it. Um, so, there are parameters uh, that, the, that it monitors on the HV to allow it to do it on the 12 volt. Uh, the other thing was the indicate sound. I've noticed a few people have complained on their um, YouTube reviews about the indicator sound being too loud. You can actually go into settings, and if you find the notifications volume, move that slider down, and that will turn the indicator sound down as well. So that was a new thing. Uh, MG Pilot. I found that MG Pilot in the new car um, it's slightly different to the old one in that when you're going down an, a fast A road, I'll call it a fast A road, a 60 mile an hour A road, where there are bends in the road, it does slow down quite a lot more than the old uh, ZSEV at the corners. When it sees a corner, it does slow down noticeably more. But on motorways, it's fine. My traffic jam assist works. Does it slow down when it's seat? Yeah, Vince, does it slow down when it sees the corner or when you turn around it? Because with the Mark 1, no, certainly, yeah, when it, you it, turn, uh, a lot of people comment they don't like. Yes, yeah, so as soon as you put a steering input in, it, um, it does yeah. slow down for the corner. And the old one used to do that as well, but this one does it more dramatically. And it's something to get used to, and I, I'm not quite there yet, but uh, it's something to get used to. The traffic jam yeah. is basically... Based on the, it's based on the steering angle sensor. So as the, if your angle goes, I think, above five degrees, then it will knock about five miles an hour off your speed. If you turn it a bit further, it knocks yeah. it down by about 10 miles an hour. I noticed it um, on the uh, junction from the M6 to the M55, which is a, it's a banked corner, uh, which is, it has 50 mile an hour speed limit in theory on it. But most people tend to take it a bit quicker than that. And as I approached it at sort of 70, like everybody else was doing, uh, um, as I started to turn the corner, it started to slow to 65. And then by the time I exited the corner, I think it was doing about 60 miles an hour. And then as I straightened back up again, it uh, obviously gained speed back to 70. Yeah, it just feels slightly different, that's all. I cover the... Um... Sorry, about There's one question. Uh, does it slow down on region? Michael. No, it uh, doesn't. Slow down the region. No, no, I don't think it does, does it? No, no it's the same as the Mark One on that. So, no, I think that's only a feature of the five, isn't it? That it is so far, yeah, yeah. Um, so, traffic jam assist. Uh, I find that works better in that previously it would felt as you came up behind the car, the brakes would come on fine, but then there would be like a crunching noise as the ABS worked etc as you came up to the back of the car in front it would be a, like a crunching noise that seems to have gone in the new car so uh that's much seems to be much more refined uh the android auto works seems to be much better more less dropouts so uh, that seems to be in, in, the way it, it feels to me is if mg listened to a lot of the complaints they had uh, originally two years ago from the first users and uh, over the last two years, 
and introduced some, you know, tweaks along the way. So it seems to work really well for me. I would also say the the comfort in the car. Um, they've used a firmer foam on the seats. Um, I don't know if you find in the Mark One, the seats are quite soft. In, um, you know, when you sit in them, I'm a six foot guy so when you sit in them you find the foam compresses quite a bit these are a lot firmer aren't they Vince so comfortable for the for longer journeys as well I, overall yeah. for me it's a hundred percent better car even though I the, the my most favorite car to date was the Mark 1 this supersedes it and it, it delivers in all the areas that I think everybody that has a Mark 1 would like it to to be honest so uh, yeah definitely keeping your order in there and waiting for the deliveries to come the other thing I noticed was the the uh, in the Mark One, everybody complained about it, the lack of um, any tints on any of the windows um, meant that the sun came through really strong and the infrared heat came through. But it's definitely noticeably less in this, even though there doesn't visually appear to be much of a tint. It does actually have quite an effect, so it doesn't come through as strong. I've not had mine tinted like you, Jake, but. Um, yeah. I've noticed that it doesn't uh, even doesn't come through the windscreen as much either. So um, it, it, it seems to be much better than it was. Yeah, but they have finally got a tinting process, I believe, in the plant in China. So the uh, yeah, the glass previously came through. It was um, specif specified like a um, B and Q greenhouse, um, and we're now yeah. to the point where it's uh, it's got a level of tint similar to I don't know a patio door. It's still not. Uh, you know, it's not tinted as such, but it, it, it definitely has UV protection in there. It does have quite, like I say, quite a noticeable effect. I, I got in the car this week, one afternoon, and it had been sat in direct sunshine. And in the previous ZS EV, I'd have got in and melted like a candle next to a fire. Um, but as I uh, came and sat in the car this time, um, it was, uh, I could even hold the steering wheel. It was quite a massive improvement over the the previous <laughs> version. So that is, that's good. And it's good to see that MGR obviously listening to this feedback and they are taking it on board. Um, I know sometimes it feels like it takes them a while to take feedback on board, but it is, it is happening. Yeah, well, I think compared with fact, some we... of the other manufacturers, they do respond much faster. Yeah, I was just going to say, Barry, um, not only the fact we, we moaned in about the ZS Mark One not having a percentage, not only do we have a percentage now, we have an app and we have all that control through the app of being able to do all the aero can, you know, you, you know, find my car, it's, 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 it is really a marked improvement. And I've not even played with the app to that extent. It did connect the first time when I connected it up, which is great. Um, use the, I've got the trophy connect. I think this Vince has got the long range uh, trophy, haven't you Vince? Um, I've yeah. not really played with the, the connect features too much. Although what I can tell you is the, the SIM card and connect features within my car, you, it comes with a standard five year license. So as I picked it up in um, on 24th of May last week, I, I've got until 2027 for that license in the Connect to run out. Um, I probably won't have the car by then. If I do, it'll be owned by my wife because the idea is that she'll get it next. Um, my son likes the voice commands um, from the back seat. He's seven year old and he says, hi, MG, open sunroof. And we're on a carriageway doing 70 miles an hour. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, and then, of course, it's so noisy, you can't say, hey, G, close some room. Yeah. You're there, <laughs> cancel, cancel, cancel. We have the same issue in our house when our 11-year-old um, worked out how to uh, operate the um, Amazon Echo devices around our property. So, you know, we'd be just sort of sat there watching TV and he'll suddenly share, come downstairs and say, I want to let you listen to this music. And, hit, and then he goes like, you know, Alexa, play. Oh, I've got one here. One sorry. Cancel. Um, <laughs> he, he shouts something, you know, play whatever horrible blooming drill music he's just heard on uh, TikTok or something. And uh, and where there's just sorry, cancel, 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 stop. Because uh, yeah, we've got like fourteen bloody Alexas in our in our in our place. So uh, the the concept, I'm just going to turn the microphone off. Just one sec. Yeah, I did mine. I did that to mine before we started the podcast. Because <laughs> <laughs> I got caught out last time. Headphones, so she can't hear. Miles, can I ask you a question? Um, yes. On on last on the last podcast or one previous to that, I think you mentioned the tyres are different on Mark One and Mark Two. If, yeah. If my Mark One is due for replacement tyres in, let's say, because it's a two-year-old just over now, 
if if at some point can I get away with putting the fifty fives on the Mark One because it fills the wheel latch a little bit more because they're taller. Uh, yes and no. So like any changes that you do to the car, like when I've had eighteen inch wheels on my ZSEV, mm. um, it's a different specifications what the car came with. Um, the problem with changing to fifty five profile tires as it was going to the two. 3, 5, 45, 18s that I had is that they're about 5% bigger uh, and have a 5% different rolling radius and circumference. Okay. So they throw your speedometer out by about 5%. Okay. So um, for every 1,000 miles that you drive, the car would only think you've done 940 or whatever, yeah? Okay. Um, so... Um, it can misrepresent the but can also misrepresent your speed. So again, you know, if you if the car says you're doing 70 miles now, you'd actually be doing say 74 or 75. Yeah. Um the so yes, they will fit. Yes, you can put them on, but they will affect the gearing slightly because it's slightly longer geared with a bigger wheel. Um so you might not have an as an initial torque, might be slightly different, it might feel you know feel slightly different to drive. Um you can fit them, but um at your own risk, basically. So yeah, I think based on what you said, certainly probably wouldn't. If you fit them and you put them on, yes, it'll fill the wheel arches better. Um, would I recommend it? Uh, officially, I've got to say no. Yeah, I don't think based on what you've said, I would actually do it. One thing as well, when you were talking there, Miles, one thing I've noticed is the uh, insulation in the new car. It's very much quieter. Um, it feels very much a more solid build. Um, and, and there are only very small differences um, but again, I th- I'm sure you'll agree it's it's definitely a more comfortable place to sit. And those digital dials in the middle of the binnacle um, get some getting used to. I mean, the, the percentage marker on the binnacle is small, but once you work out where things are, I think the biggest challenge for me, because I haven't driven it that much at the moment, is fathoming out the infotainment system and using the shortcut buttons and all of that. I haven't really had too much to play around with it. But. Yeah, have you seen? So you can you know you can map the star button on the steering wheel to. Yeah. an option one of them is a shortcut panel and that yeah. shortcut panel gives you access to a couple of features um i think there's one is like hill hold control hill descent or something like that another one uh, abs off i think it is and then they've got things like to adjust the brightness of the screen and the volumes of the various different inputs and outputs and stuff so that's quite a useful one to sort of because you know it's so you can make the screen go completely black for example if you're driving late at night you don't want the glare of the screen on you yeah um so yeah, there's a few things like that that are quite useful to try on the on the. Um, I had the um, standard range ZSEV facelift um, for all of about a week um, until uh, I'm not bitter about this at all until work sold it again. Um, so um, yes, yeah, so for one week and about 400 miles, I had the uh, ZSEV standard range. Um, if you're watching uh, Elizabeth, I really hope you're very happy with my car. Um, the uh, <laughs> uh, it was um, no, no, it's lovely trophy red, yeah. Um, uh, so um, yeah, I was driving at the standard range, and I got um, I did 180 miles uh, on a charge, um, which I thought was pretty good going, really. For again, it, the WLTP is 199. Um, I was driving to Wigan and back, and, and so on, and you know to Chorley, and so a lot of it was on the motorway as well. Um, so I was quite pleased, really, with that sort of um, efficiency from it. Um, obviously, you know, if you tonked it and it was raining outside and you had the heaters on and stuff, it got worse efficiency. But, yeah, over the weekend, I'm going to Wigan. It was 100 and 180 miles I had before I charged it up with, like, 5% left. So I was pretty good going, I thought. Um, so so what was your typical miles miles per, um, per kilowatt you were getting? Did you... Note that it time. was it was between three point nine and four point one. Hmm. Um, so was- Barry, what Barry, what I've noticed is because I every time I leave my house because I'm on the top of a hill, every time I'm going down the hill in this mark, I was always getting sort of between four and five miles per kilowatt. But in the new Mark Two, it can get up to ten, <laughs> um, and <laughs> dramatically drops um, really quickly. But it, it's it's still holding up at sort of four on average. Um, four. Hmm. But, you know, certainly this time, I would imagine sort of in winter, it'll be down sort of 3.123, something like that. But um, at the moment, it's doing rather well. And, you know, I'm, I'm quite impressed with it, definitely. 
the talk as well on the the car. I know that there's talk about the actual power being less on the the Mark II. I'm not finding that. I find it quicker, to be honest, um, and in a more controlled way as well. So you can tell it's a a new motor in there, and it's got a slightly different wine to it. And I quite enjoy the wine. I turn the radio down to listen to the to the music makes. I quite like that. <laughs> Yeah, that's just me, a bit quirkiness, but um, yeah, it's. it's well, I had a, yeah. On, I, I had a wine on mine, which wasn't um, a wine that should have been there, um, and uh, I, I put it in for its second year service, and said, you know, I'm getting this wine. If I'm holding, if I'm holding a speed, it's going wah 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 wah. And it uh, sounds more like gear wine than anything else. So they did the service, came back and said to me, no, we've been out in it. And we were actually thinks our service manager thinks it's quieter than his. And when I drove home, it was a lot quieter. Now, I don't know if they sort of packed it with, with oil or grease or something like that, but the car is a much quieter car now. Or it could have been just there's some insulation. Sound insulation wasn't in the right place, but it got cleared mm -hmm. up on the service. One of the users uh, on YouTube was asking about the lights. So I'll just say uh, the LED headlights in the new uh, facelift are much, much better. Uh, you notice that straight away. I don't know, if Jake, if you've driven yours at night yet, but... Not yet, no. They're very much... You get that flat line, that clear, defined flat line, and uh, they're much brighter, and they don't dazzle at all. So I'm, I'm really impressed. You know, there's quite a few users change the incandescent to LED, Bulbs for the Mark One, mm. obviously with the Mark Two, it's no need to do any of that. It's already there. Yeah. Really yeah. good lights. That's good. Yeah, I think that well, changing those lights to LEDs on the Mark One is um, technically uh, an illegal modification because the car it takes it off spec again, doesn't it, Miles? Just it does. Yeah, time. yeah. So if you, if you go for the Mark Two, uh, obviously which has LEDs as standard. Uh, you do notice a big difference. I noticed the difference between the MG5, which again has halogens, uh, versus the ZS EV standard range. Um, so when I got into the standard, because I had the standard range, I say until last Thursday, and then I got thrown unceremoniously into a MG5. Um, I um, I noticed a big difference uh, the next day when I was driving, because it was again late-ish when I was coming back from Blackpool, and uh, we had a, a series of events all, all our dealerships last week. Um, and I noticed a big difference between the um, the lights in the in the standard range which I enjoyed for the previous week, and then the MG5. The the seats in the uh, standard in the new facelift have got more padding than the original version of the ZSCV. They feel a lot more comfy. Yeah. Um, one thing I, know, I liked about the MG5 prior to driving the facelift uh, ZS was that the MG5 seats are quite comfy as well. They've got quite a lot of, quite a good bolstering and they've got quite a lot of support. Um, but the new um, ZSEV certainly it's got the same if not better bolstering than the than the MG5 so again things that make the car feel more premium uh, make it feel a bit more uh, well-rounded well-finished and um, I have to say I think that it looks fantastic in that picture behind you Jake I think it, it really stands out as a good-looking car um, yeah, quite, quite, yeah. quite a quite a simple facelift that they've done in many ways you know this, you know the headlights are different the great the lack of grill at the front but I do think it, I think it looks smart. Um, so yeah, um, I've just noticed uh, there's a couple of questions on the forum, on the Facebook group, on the YouTube uh, group, saying uh, asking about motorability on the facelift ZS. Um, so the reason that the facelift ZS EV has been taken off the motorability scheme is because, as per a couple of weeks ago, um, MGs stopped taking orders completely on the new ZS EV. And that's because uh, they got to nine months lead time and they didn't want to have to stand by pricing for the next nine months plus on those orders, which are hanging on and hanging on and hanging on. So they've stopped taking orders on the new ZSCV. So that's why it's gone off the uh, motability lists. Uh, when MG reopens the list, the uh, orders, then it'll be back on motability. But it's just at the moment, MG is not taking any new orders for the ZSCV. The MG5 is also not on the list um, because the MG5 has stopped taking orders a couple of weeks ago because in advance of the uh, anticipation of the new model coming out at the end of this year. Um, 
So that's uh, so just seen it. What's this, John Tom's manager? Jake, did you find out what that little speaker is for? Um, Un underneath the um, under the, you know where the Vince? Do you know where the um, bonnet card, card slots used to be? Yeah, yeah, and the, there's a card slot down there. That's right. And now there's what appears to be a speaker grill. Have you have you any idea? I don't really know what that's for. To be no, honest. I don't. I don't know what it's for. I, I I went to put my cards in there. You know, all my all my uh, RFID cards. And yeah. uh, now I have to put them in the in the cubby hole. So uh, no, I, I haven't found out what that speaker's for. I thought it might be the indicator day one, but when I found the slider, and if you listen to the door speaker, it's definitely coming out the door speaker for the indicator. So yeah. I've no idea what that's for. Unless it's some, unless it's a sensor of some sort, Miles. Unless I'm thinking it could be a couple of things. It could be you know the outside noise versus the inside cabin noise and the radio volume or it could be and i can't imagine it is that but it could also be due to my connect and the the, the commands but i would have thought that had come through the overhead mic rather than having a mic down the yeah yeah no, I mean, normally when you have that sort of vent low down on the dashboard it's usually to do with climate control you know it's like okay. an internal humidity sensor sort of thing but normally that's towards the middle of the car rather than the the outer um yeah often there's like little vents that you know so sort of by the by your left knee, you know, yeah, in, you know, in the in the uh, UK, uh, there's a little vent down there. But um, no, I haven't actually looked. I'll have to look and see if what that is. But there, um, I haven't got I'm my hand too short myself. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Um, Toba, um, it can tow, can't it? The yes, the new ZSEV can tow to 500 kilos, but as uh, Willie Chewbacca and. Uh, Tim have said on the forum, uh, on the YouTube group, there's no stock really at the moment of these tow bars. Um, I don't know where we can get them from. I'm, I'm trying to find a stockist ourselves, but we haven't been able to find any in stock at the moment. It's a riddle. I don't know um, if this is linked to any other sort of production delay or what. I don't know what's you know what's the hold -up reason for this hold up. But um, yeah, if I find some stock, I'll let I'll let the the, the group know. Um, at the moment, I haven't been able to find any stock. It's a Rittle um, uh, tow bar, is it? Uh, Witter, make one. Witter, for Witter. But the moment yeah. you go on the website and it says on, not available and you call around and there's no stock anywhere. So, all oh, right. Um, there is one available, but they haven't made it or built it or made enough quantity. I don't know which. Yeah. What and it's, is it it's a 50 kilo nose weight on that? Yeah, 50 kilo oh. nose weight, 500 kilos tow weight. Um, so it's fine for like, you know, a couple of bikes or a little trailer. Mm. There was a lot of comments on the forum um, a couple of weeks back about that and people trying to get their head around the difference between the time weight and the uh, the nose weight. So uh, if you've not towed, it's, it can be perhaps a little confusing. Right. Now, um, on the on our opening uh, comments of what we said we were going to be talking about tonight, we're going to say, you know, what attracted you to the... Um, to the new ZS and then uh, oh, what's most impressed you? I think we've kind of like covered quite a bit of that now, but yeah. uh, was there anything that um, just a final question on that? When you got the car, you thought it might be okay, or you weren't quite sure if, if it was something that you would really you want, because I think both of you've really talked about the, uh, the range as being a, a, a reason for buying it, but was there one thing that sort of went, wow, yeah, that's really impressive. Uh, for me, it was definitely the range versus the price. I think, you know, um, I suppose it's the same with all of them. the second-hand cars and second-hand EVs are, quite, are holding their value anyway now. So the price I was getting compared to the price I had to pay for the increase in range, for me, that was, that was it. It was a matter of driving the test drive car to confirm that it was no worse. And it was certainly, and in, in reality, it was a lot better. So it was easy to convince the wife. Yeah, same for yeah. me. Um, okay. I, I had the same decision maker. <laughs> I had the same feeling as Vince. You get in it, you test drive it. You can instantly tell it's a um, an easier, more comfier car to drive. You've not got the worry about the range, especially when you know every month or so you do a long journey. You're not having to stop. So that comfort blanket of knowing um, you're not having to pull in anywhere is great. Um, and yeah, I, I would agree with Vince. It's uh, a no-brainer when somebody around the corner from me has only recently just bought a Kia e Nero, and 
think he paid upwards of 36k for it and uh, you know he's he's getting probably the same range as us but with a smaller battery but we've obviously um got a got a good price on these mgs so you know they're, they're great definitely so yeah and, and you've got ranges out there as well if you don't need the range i understand is that right miles so uh that does bring us on to another later topic, mm. which is about stock availability generally um and basically, uh, as I said before, MG stopped taking orders on the new ZSEV, um, and they've uh, that's because they've got lo really long lead times. Uh, we did get a um, a load of uh, standard range ZSEVs. Now, uh, two weeks ago, when we did this chat, I said, "Look, you know, we've just got eighty five of these cars secured. If anyone would like some, give us a shout." Uh, and two weeks later, every single one has sold. So. Um, in fact, they'd all sold by the you know, sort of middle of last week, which is why I ended up having to come out of my ZSEV that I'd managed to get and I'm into an MG5 instead. Um, so the yeah, there is strong demand for electric vehicles out there still. And if you've got a car in stock, it goes very quickly. So yeah, we're looking at um the uh yeah, standard range, but so we had um 85 come in stock, we've sold all 85 within two weeks. Um, they decided to deliver them all pretty much on one day. So on uh, Thursday last week, um, Burnley had four transporters turn up and Shirley had seven transporters turn up all before 10 a.m. So that was fun from a point of, you know, 70 cars being dropped at site at one go. Um, so I think that, yeah, in terms of availability, you may still find some dealers have some standard range in stock. But we've certainly sold through all of ours. At the moment, we can't take any new orders, so that's a limit for us. Uh, hopefully, when MG uh, reopens the order book, that'll be when they've got some shorter lead times. At the moment, um, and this comes on to talking about, uh, I think about the very one of the first questions we had uh, from Adam Jessup on the uh, chat right before we even started today. Can we have an update on the November orders, the ZS long range delivery dates, please? Um, as Jake and a couple of others will testify. We have had some cars come in that were ordered back in November, these uh, long range connects and um, long range trophies. Um, but we had like say 20 out of the you know 150 cars that we had delivered from MG. Um, 20 of them were the long range cars, the rest were standard range or MG5s or HS FEVs. Um, the uh, Long range cars, they are still experiencing shortages of parts, um, particularly on the Connect models. So that's why we haven't had so many of the Connect models come through yet. Unfortunately, 90% of our first orders that people placed back in November were for the long range Trophy Connects. Um, the downside is that they're the ones that need the most semiconductors, they're the ones that have the shortage of parts. And if you were to cancel your order and change to a different model, you're going to lose out on the two and a half thousand pound government grant, which is only valid against that particular model if it was ordered prior to the 15th of December. So we're stuck with a rock and a hard place, really. Um, we're waiting for the cars. MG wants to get at the cars because, again, there's been cost increases since they took those orders and those orders are price protected. So, you know, if you committed to an order in November last year, the RRP was about 750 to 800 pounds cheaper than what it is now um and uh that's the issue with uh you know mg don't want to keep those cars forever on order they want to get them handed over because at the moment with 10 percent inflation across most of the marketplace and, and slightly higher you know 10 percent inflation on a zscv is three thousand pounds extra um so it's uh it's gonna have a knock-on effect i think there is going to be a lot of prices going up on the, in the automotive industry as well um and then um yeah i think that sort of covers hopefully that so yeah we've got no cars left um ourselves there may be some odd cars i think luscombe's had some standard range cars delivered as well uh, shout out to sam luscombe if you're uh, going to get some business off the back of this good luck sam um the um uh but yeah we're, we're sold out and we don't know when we're going to get any more stock in um until the next time that MG send us a few transporters full of hopefully some long range trophy connects. Where did you get yours, Vince? Where did you order yours? 
I ordered mine in November last year, a week before the government chopped the grant. So um, I didn't cancel mine, so I kept the uh, kept the grant discount, and that's two and a half thousand pounds. And that's one of the reasons that uh, I'm, you know, another reason that I'm really pleased with the car. So I got a damn good deal. So well, and what I, dealer I, was it, Vince? What dealer was it? Say again. What, what dealer was it? Dealer uh, Eden in Swindon, Eden MG. Okay. Um, so it's retail price. I just got the full government grant off it, so the price I paid was a really good price. You know, at the end of the day. So, um, and while I'm on, I saw one of the uh, questions on YouTube was about charging speed. How is the charging speed for the new facelift? So um, the only rapids that I've plugged into have been 50 kilowatt rapids, and at 38 percent battery i plugged into a 50 kilowatt osprey and that immediately went up to 49 uh, kilowatt rate charging rate yeah. so it went up to the max that the charger would do and it didn't drop off um much it started dropping off at 83 percent and i got to 90 percent and it was still pulling 22 kilowatts at 90 percent so that's better definitely much better than the uh, mark one but the battery's bigger so there's there's more space to take it so you'd expect it to be uh, better anyway. So, and that was at seven degrees outside. So that's pretty good. That's good. There's a longer charging curve, isn't there, Miles? When we tested it. Yeah, it does seem to. Um, I haven't been asked. I just I'll dig out the paperwork. But basically, I think it from like sort of about twenty five percent to pretty much about seventy percent. It was holding two hundred yeah. amps, wasn't it, on that height on that faster yeah. charger. It was so it was uh, able to charge pretty fast for a lot, and it's a, uh, that's what you need really. Is it, you want a a good flat rate? What the problems we've had previously with other EVs and with the MGs before is that they'd they'd peak really early and then they'd drop off, and so by the time you got to fifty percent, you were you weren't even at fifty kilowatts; you were below, you know, and then it'd drop off even even more. Um, the Tesla Model Three peaks massively um, at low state of charge. And then drops off so um it can get some really impressive numbers between say you know 15 to 40 percent and then it, it tails off massively um with the um with the mgz and cv it, it does seem to keep a good strong rate all the way till sort of 70 percent, and even 80 percent, it was still pulling a reasonable reasonable charge rate so um if you look in the forum you'll find the uh last little graph that we did you know when we did the rapid charging test um Possibly need to go back and do that again sometime with a charge that isn't limited to 200 amps. I think that probably we could have got a better charge rate than we actually yeah. did. I think it was, uh, we didn't realize at the time until somebody pointed out afterwards that that particular site was limited to 200 amps, the maximum. Um, it's all those van drivers at Skelton. Um, yeah, at, Le at Leeds Skelton Lake, we wanted to go to the Anathy chargers, but there was like a queue of seven del DPD delivery vans that were all waiting to charge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's really important for EV owners to get to grips with a couple of things which make them different from ICE cars. Um, because you're not going to um, a forecourt and filling up and then getting, you know, in, in, in three minutes, filling up 700 miles with a diesel. Um, it, you know, there is a different strategy to it. And one of them that you, you need to know is how your car behaves. And, you know, that first the the uh, the 10 to uh 30 percent um charge rate how many miles does that put on per minute and then the 30 to 60 how many miles per minute does that put on because you know trying to get a, if you're trying to make a a journey and and uh, you've got a long range a, a long one to go it, it makes a lot of sense sometimes to just keep your battery in that low range where you're going to when you stop you're going to get the, uh, the the rapid charges because if you keep topping up and you're all you know you get it down to about 70 percent and then stick it on a rapid charger and wonder why this car doesn't charge very fast well no because you're in the wrong part of the curve mm. yeah yeah and and of course the new facelift has the yeah. the battery heater as well for colder temperatures so if you yeah. 20 minutes half an hour before you get there that should help as well mm. Mm yeah so i mean we we've heard um miles you you um 
covered the the issue of uh, what's happening with delivery dates like well there aren't any i imagine that we'll be in a position when they come back on the order books the prices will go up and you can't comment really on how much they will go up i understand that i don't i don't know there is I think we lost him, did we? Yes, we might have yeah. lost him, unfortunately. Just, um, yeah, he, he was obviously just, cut off by MG. Um, <laughs> one quick question. <laughs> He's so, about to say something that he shouldn't. Yeah, one quick question. So the black um, yeah. uh, facelift has uh, the black grills and the colour ones um, have got different colours. Um, I saw one dealer, I think it was Leeds. Um, Lots of gums. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are doing wraps for them. Yeah, they look good. They they do look good. So I think yeah. there have been a few members that have said they like the, you know, in Barry's picture and your picture behind you both, uh, Michael and Barry, you've got the old bill, which um, does look nice. And some some owners do prefer that. Look. Um, so if you've got a blue, a white, a red uh, Mark II, um, those grills do look rather nice. And I know Lust Luscombs have done some great jobs on not only just wrapping the grill, but actually doing a wrap on the roof as well to sort of blacken the roof as well. So mm. all sorts done and it, it does look really good. I went for the black purposefully because I just prefer having that uh, solid looking grill anyway. Um, but yeah, it does. Color. Black does look nice. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's the already handle, dirty, the door handle's colour coded. No, no, they've still got the silver tops to them. Um, but my car's filthy already. So that's one reason for not getting a black. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to wash it every two days yeah you do yeah. that's true yeah <laughs> I, I i'm i'm actually um barred from even looking at a white or a black car <laughs> by my wife <laughs> because of that uh for the back hmm? heater how does it activate does it use maps or no it's it's a manual uh setting within the uh battery features of the infotainment system so it's literally an on-off switch um, so if you turn it on um, and you're in preparation driving to a rapid charge, which I've not yet done, actually, unlike Vince, going to a rapid charge, you probably put it on half an hour before. I think it warms the coolant up within the battery, uh, and that's the heater element um, that's warming the battery as you're approaching. If you turn your car off when you then plug your rapid charger in, uh, the battery heater feature turns itself off so that when you reboot the car to set off, that feature's in the off position. You, you have no worry. That's one of the uh, minor. One of the minor. If I was to say this is an improvement, would be good to see the battery temperature in uh, on the screen somewhere. So while you're driving along, I noticed in the Mark One, um, if, as we drove along, the battery temperature because I used an app to find out what the battery temperature was. It used to creep up slowly, but on your first rapid charge, it banged up to about thirty. 30 degrees C, and then um, it would stay about 29, 28, 30 degrees C. And uh, at that point, there's no point putting a battery heater on because that's all it'll take it up to anyway. So in your second rapid charge, you're already at a, a yeah. decent, uh, that's, that's the problem with the leaf. So that would be good to actually mm. see the um, battery temperature on a screen somewhere. But at yeah. the end of the day, it's not the end of the world, so. No, no. Right, right. Yeah, I mean the um, there's there's um, it was mentioned Miles. You know, we spoke to Miles about this um, last time. Uh, the sh standard range has got a different battery chemistry to the um, to the long range. So yeah. for the standard range, it's a switch to LEP. Um, so that's uh, lion. Uh, that's that's um, lithium iron phosphate uh, battery chemistry. Um, which, um, unlike the long range, which you should on a daily basis charge only to 80% if you want to preserve the life of the battery, uh, LEPs like to be charged to 100% at least once a week, uh, and they're preferred on a daily basis to go to that. So if you take the 50, 51 uh, kilowatt hours on the, on the standard range, as, uh, and what that charges in, and then your your, your neighbours charging their um, long range to eighty uh, percent. There's only about thirty to 30, 35 miles difference between the range you're going to get from that charge uh, between the two. But the chemistries are different, 
and they respond differently. For example, the uh, LEPs uh, don't like ch taking a high charge when they're cold. They, it, it can really sort of unsettle them. So they, the, the charge circuitry limits the charge rate you're going to get at those low temperatures. So battery heating is really important for those. Yeah. Welcome back, Miles. Hi, guys. Sorry, my computer basically just decided to install an update as i was talking and uh oh right took off my I'm, I'm using a laptop with a separate display and it all just went yeah to down the pan yeah. so um oh, what okay. i was going to talk well, about, talk sorry. about we, we kept the, we're going to talk about now the rapid charging i think now we, we, uh, yeah yeah sorry yeah so last time we were on we talked about and vince you've had this issue where basically you plug in your, your uh, facelift car into a rapid charger typically an osprey charger and um something goes wrong and the car gets a error message that you can't then start the car yeah my, like mine, mine was on the, uh, the battery charged up to 90 percent, and when i stopped the charge using the osprey app that's when everything went wrong hv shut off and uh, um vehicle control system fault wouldn't move call the aa out i tried all the mark one tricks disconnect the battery switch it off for 10 minutes try again come back in 10 minutes Disconnect the battery, leave it for five minutes. None of those worked. Um, got the three AA men, an AA man came out, plugged in his laptop. Um, his laptop wouldn't connect to the car, wouldn't talk to the car. It connects, but it wouldn't talk to the car. Um, he phoned up his mate, another AA man, and he brought his laptop mm -hmm. out. His wouldn't communicate with the car. Third guy came out, his wouldn't communicate. So in the, long story short, it got um, flat bedded back 180 miles. But the dealer sorted it out within 10 minutes so yeah so uh what the issue seems to be is that it's causing certain chart and i think i explained this last time on the on the group but if i didn't then i'll say it here um so when mg were readying the vehicle for launch and they did this with all of the zscvs they did it with the original zscv and they did it with the mg5 they're doing it currently with the mg4 um, and the MG5 facelift. They drive them all around the UK in camouflage and they try as many rapid charges as they possibly can. And the, basically to make sure it won't fail. So obviously CCS standards are written ISO, ISO standards, which communicate, which talk about the communication between the car and the charger, the charger and the car. And they should all, if they're written to work with the, within the standards, they should all work. They should all, there shouldn't be any issues because they should all, you know, they're all talking the same language. Uh, what seems to happen is that there's different version numbers um, of software on both the chargers and the cars. And so sometimes really old cars can have issues or sometimes really new cars can have issues with older chargers um, or different version numbers. So MG does deliberately drive them around all these different, you know, I spoke to one guy, uh, one of the engineers, he done like 15,000 miles in three months just driving around all these different charges, trying to try all the different charges, making sure they all work. Having said that, um, there's been an issue obviously with certain charges with the ZSEV facelift um, and MG have got a newer version of software which cures this issue. However, um, some of the cars, some of the early cars that were handed over, Vince yours being one of them, cars that were handed over prior to May um may not have had this update because basically when they were when the car was made in the factory in like november last year um and then shipped on the water it didn't get updated by the dealership when it arrived here because uh, the dealership was under the instructions that in the event a um you get a car in for service and don't basically update any of the software unless we tell you to because some of the software may be beta test version. It may not be the final version. You could potentially damage the car by updating the software. Um, this information is why dealers typically wouldn't have updated any of the ECUs unless they specifically were told to by MG. So on the 9th of May, MG sent out um, a communication to dealers uh, code AS-22-025 which said that um, from now on, to make sure that customers receive the very best EV experience from day one, um, make the following changes to PDI um, for ZSEV, MG5, and all future EV models, 
carry out the following updates at PDI or scheduled maintenance or servicing um, and uh, updates the VCU, the EVCC, the CCU, the BMS and the TC. So these are all different vehicle ECUs on the MG's system. So when a dealer plugs into their car and they go, they basically see, you know, 45 different ECUs on their system, they can then select these particular ones for update. Each one um, is going to take around sort of 10 minutes or so to update. Um, there's a new um, reference, zero AS22028, that's gone out to dealers today, just letting them know that if they need to do these updates, they can claim the time back from MG um, as part of the warranty procedure. So obviously the dealer's time gets paid for, because I think that's part of the concern was that customers after two weeks ago, and I said that there's this new update, customers were going to the dealer and saying, I need these updates because my car's going to brick at a rapid charge if I don't get them. And the dealer was then saying, well, if we're going to take your car into the workshop and plug it in for an hour, who's paying for our time? Um, because if MG weren't paying for it and the customer wasn't paying for it, then effectively the dealer was paying for something and the dealer hadn't been given any information about how they were going to get the time paid. But today, that's now been clarified, they can claim for that time from MG, which is good news for the dealers. doesn't make a difference to the customer, I suppose, apart from they might have less of an argument about getting it done. Um, but yeah, so there is uh, updates that need to be done. Um, some of those updates may have been done at the factory with the newer cars. Um, but with the extended sort of lead times that we're seeing, you know, cars that have been built and then sat awaiting a new head unit or whatever at the docks in China before it was then posted across to us, um, means it could have been uh, a later version of software or an earlier version of software, shall I say. So, um, yeah, MJG now just saying, please can all EVs be updated, these five ECUs, um, if applicable, if they haven't already been done at the point of PDI. Um, and then it'll get updated every year on servicing if needs be as well so hopefully going forward if there are any further updates they will be done as well good thanks for that mars um yeah that's a, a very important um aspect of um car ownership isn't it to know what what you've got uh that you've got the right software and the car's running right correctly yeah I think one of the other as a user of the car as a customer as an owner of a car you can't tell the version number and the dealer doesn't know the version number unless they plug the laptop in. So it's not something that you can sort of look on the center console and go, ah, yes, well, I need such and such an update. Instead, it's um, based on, you know, you've got to plug it into this to see what the version numbers are. So it's not something simple just by, I say, you know, looking at the car dashboard as to whether you'd know if it's had the updates or not. Hmm. Hmm. Quite. So, I mean, there was some comment um, a month or so back, somebody asking about what whether they had the right version number and uh, that someone being telling them, we'll just go into the uh, just go into the information system. You can read the version number off there. You can't because there's you not... Can, that's on the version number for the infotainment system. So, and incidentally, the current version for the infotainment software is uh, version 16. So if you have an earlier version of infotainment, it might be you need an update from the dealership on that. Um, yeah, so Miles, I think mine offers know a, as a user really I think, easily. I think mine offers an over the over the air update on that. Miles, if I go in the infotainment system, it, it allows me to click on update. It searches via the four G uh, SIM card, and then it's obviously only for the infotainment. I realise that, um, but it seems to let me do that within the car. Um, but obviously, the ECU is a dealer based, aren't they? Yeah, so the infotainment system update, there was one that was um, brought out by MG around sort of January, February time. Um, and that should have um, given the option. So that initial update should have been done by the dealer because I think basically that was preventing the over-the-air updates from working. So if you're on version 16, over-the-air updates should work from now on. Um, if it was version 14 or earlier, I think then it was... Um, not able to do the over the updates properly so that's why it needed updating by the dealer good and is that only for the connect version or is that for all across the board across the board thanks hmm. yeah standard okay. range and long range trophy trophy connect se yeah 
there's uh, i know there's some people out there wanting to hear one of uh, some co uh, comments on one of the other topics that we talked about because uh, before we close which is that of the rapid charge of contention and um i i think that as we get more ev car evs on the road and we get a uh, roll out of more rapid chargers i don't think one's keeping pace with the other so what's uh, what's the life experience of uh, driving your ev and uh, coming to charges which are full and queuing well for me certainly uh, this happened to me in wales i pulled into uh, a lidl's car park and uh, there was a nissan leaf charging in front of me and uh, i asked him and he said uh, oh about 10 15 minutes so for me there was only one guy and he was charging so the queuing was obvious I had a quick look round and nobody else came and said, I'm first or whatever. But what I did notice in front of me, right, and if I hadn't have looked at it and read it, there's a 90 minute um, wait parking limit. So as soon as you've driven in to that car park, you've started your 90 minutes. And if, if he's, you've got to wait 20 minutes for this chap to finish, that's eating into your 90 minutes. That's something definitely mm. you've got to be wary of. Otherwise, you'll end up with a parking fine. Yeah, that happened to my daughter, actually, when she was driving down to the West Country. She'd uh, queued to get into, it was on a Friday night, silly time to travel, in my opinion, but there you go. Uh, she queued, she was queuing for, for her parking. Then she parked in, uh, to charge. By that time, she needed a coffee. She went for a coffee, came back, and ended up with a, with, uh, a penalty notice on the parking. Because by the time she'd put a decent amount of charge on it. Yeah, I think there's... There are some uh, charges in, like say, um, particularly like parking eye controlled car parks where there is no sort of leniency. There's no, you know, it's black and white on the system. You know, if you're five minutes mm -hmm. over, then they send you a letter and a, and a fine sort of thing. Um, it, I, again, it, you know, there are some motorway services where there's two hour part, you know, waiting limits and things like that as well. Um, I think that, um, I think it's acknowledged by all by everyone in the industry, everyone who's to do with EVs, everyone who's got an EV, everyone who's thinking about getting an EV, is that um, the charging infrastructure just isn't keeping pace of where we need to be at the moment. Um, I think that the uh, expectation, the anticipation that people have, particularly those who are new to the idea of an electric car, um, who are you know have just got expectations from previous petrol and diesel cars, is that you're going to go to a petrol station kind of the forecourt, like the new grid serve locations. You're going to plug in. It's going to be easy. The, ca the cables will beach. Um, you won't have to reverse in, stroke driving forwards, stroke straddle two lines, just to be able to get your cable to reach. Um, that you'll use a contactless debit or credit card, and you won't need to have a certain app, or you won't need to um, have a certain RFID card or app or whatever. Um, and I think that's the expectation that people have. That's, but that's realistically what people should expect because it's absolutely in order to be a usable system, it has to have that level of user friendliness that people understand. You know, it, it is easy to use. If if you went to a SO petrol station, um, had to reverse onto pump four, um, had to um, plug your car in and then uh, go on your phone download an app put a credit card or debit direct debit payment against it um sign up to that pay a slightly inflated rate because you're not one of their members who pays 7.95 a month um <laughs> do the whole situation and then find out that um somebody else was breathing down your neck saying that they wanted to um fill their car with fuel and that you've already you've already got uh, three quarters of a tank so how can you possibly need any more than that I think people wouldn't really accept it. And I think that that's kind of the issue with electric vehicles at the moment is that those of us have had electric vehicles for a long time, and I've, you know, seven, eight years in the job now, um, sort of forget sometimes that, you know, just because we've got used to something being suboptimal doesn't mean that everyone else has the same expectation and that should indeed have that same expectation and, you know, should believe that that's um, reasonable, really. So... Yeah, I think that uh, we need to make sure that um, the, the the system works better than it does now. And that's going to take uh, government intervention. It's going to take legislation. Um, it's going to take 
investment on a massive scale. Um, and it's going to take um, basically people kicking off more and not just accepting that this is the way forward. Because ultimately, you know, it, it, people need to get upset about how hopeless it is to charge at some of these sites. When my um, when the wife uh, when my wife was uh, went to Manchester Airport, she flew to uh, away for a weekend with some friends. They came back. The friend has a ZSEV uh, standard range original long you know, original version. Gen 1, and they'd forgotten to charge it before they set off to go to the airport. So they had like 10% left on the charger when they got uh, on the car when they got back to Manchester Airport. Uh, um, the plane was supposed to land at 11, 8, 11 p.m. It landed at 1.30 in the morning. It was delayed. So at 1.30 in the morning, they're leaving Manchester Airport trying to find a working rapid charger. Um, and if you look at Manchester Airport on a map, you'll see that there's uh, there's a little nearby, but uh, there's contention there about as to whether they're able to use those at the moment. Uh, there was uh, a couple of um, uh, BP pulse chargers um, nearby in a car park that looked like um, people were definitely shot and murdered there. I think there's a lot of Tesla ones open now, isn't there, Miles? <laughs> uh, there is now some Tesla chargers. Yeah. So yeah, um, but again, this that's at Manchester Trafford Park. So again, that was even further out of their range. They ended up going to um, the nearest motorway services, which was Lim. Um, Lim services. Uh, the motorway was closed. They had a diversion of uh, five miles. They got to Lim services at uh, three o'clock in the morning with. Um, something like seven miles left on the car. So it must be down like at 1% was the car. And the reason I sent them to limb services was because I knew that at least there it was illuminated. There's a McDonald's nearby. They could pop to the toilet, they could get a coffee. You know, they were relatively safe um, compared to if yeah. they're in the middle of nowhere, you know, trying to, you know, they have no, most chargers that are off the motorway have no infrastructure around them. They've got no, shop where you can get a drink there's no you know like i say like a petrol station where you can go in and perhaps use a toilet and get a coffee or something there's there's nothing and it's not really acceptable um you know for a group of ladies on their own at four in the morning trying to find no, someone no, no. safe so i think that um more needs to be done um and we need to yeah. improve that with regards to tesla supercharger I'd... yes there's um Tr manchester trafford park is the nearest one to us uh up north um, I believe there's some. You've got the map on the screen next to yeah, us yeah, there yeah, showing the new one. Yeah. So it's not every Tesla site. Um, and they're also charging 60 pence, I think, per kilowatt hour, is it? Or 69 pence? It's a, something like that. Yeah, 60, 61. 60, yeah. So it, it's, a, it, it's a price which is similar to what you might pay at Ionity. Um, I'm personally not going to make the journey just for the sake of it. Um, I think that Manchester Trafford Centre. Um, is not the best location to try and charge at anyway because of the fact that one of the Manchester service centres for uh, and the handover centre for uh, Tesla is there. So they're pretty much always te charging their new Teslas that are just being handed over. They did about a thousand in a, in a month last month, I think. So those charges are pretty well hammered by them. Um, but yes, there are a lot of uh, the night. 14 sites in the UK, I think, that now open to Tesla. They're there. Yeah, they're there on the map um, up on the screen now. Again, um, part of the problem can be that, um, depending on the car you're in, obviously with MG is on the front, that's not too bad. But with some cars where the chargers are on the rear passenger side or like my wife's car, my wife's old car, the Jaguar, was on the uh, front uh, passenger side wing, um, that could be a not optimal location for a tesla charger because the charge that you normally park in would be if you drew front parking it would be by the driver's side headlight with the charge so it would charge for that particular car so and the cable won't reach across the passenger rear so it means you end up using the charger to your left which is supposed to be used by the car in this in the space to the left of you so it's uh, the location is not optimal in quite a lot of things i think driving through um drive through charges like we have petrol stations would be optimal um, like the new grid serve locations, like Fastnet in the Netherlands. I think those sort of charging stations are what we should try and encourage rather than the sort of nose-in or rear-in bays. Personally, that's my thought. Yeah, I mean, we've seen in Europe, there's lots of really good examples. We've seen what's happened in, in Norway, and we've seen what's happened on the, some of the major routes in there. And, I mean, we've got... Um, We've got access to the uh, to MPs and things that we can write to 
maybe we should, everyone on the forum, write to their local MP and insist that we actually get the services uh, out there for EVs, which are going to enable us to hit the, uh, the, the decarbonising targets. No, I, think there's, I think there's going to be, I say, massive investment and it needs government coordination because uh, if you're a profitable business, you're not necessarily going to put charges in a location which is um, less footfall. You're going to aim for the high footfall places. You're going to aim for the places where you think you're going to make a profit out of it. Um, a bit like phone boxes, you know, it's the ones that you need, the ones in the middle of nowhere. Um, the ones that are in, you know, in an urban situation, like, you know, you go to Milton Keynes and you're falling over the blooming charges. There's literally, you know, 12 on every street corner. If you go to... Uh, North well, Wales. North Wales, <laughs> North, North Wales, Yorkshire, yeah. you know, Whitby, any of these sort of places. Um, there's there's a handful of charges, often just seven kilowatt, and not really up to standard for, for what you require. So I think that we need to um, really, yeah, look at what's possible what's you know what's uh what's worth the government spending some extra money on and, and investing in because yeah as you can see that area on the map has just been swiped over by um stuart there you know there's big areas of the, of the lake district in north yorkshire and scotland where and wales where there's more sheep than people and um there's not a strong business case for put, installing a what can be a you know a thirty thousand pound rapid charger plus a twenty thousand pound grid connection um in these areas if they think that they're going to be you know just vandalized or bits nicked off the you know because they're not good being watched regularly so yeah i mean with you mentioned about the telephone boxes of course um uh, when it was uh, gpo and and bt there was a public service uh, obligation uh, to that license that they had to uh, put uh, things in uneconomic places so that they could provide that public service. Yeah. I say it, government mandating is different to um, private business investment. I think, you know, that there needs to be some sort of shove, whether it's a, whether it's a carrot or a stick, uh, there needs to be some sort of government intervention there. Um, yeah, the Welsh Dave government. Johnson, good luck with uh, your MP. Yeah, the Welsh <laughs> government was terrible uh, <laughs> up until recently because um, they've been saying, oh, we'll let the market uh, um, decide. And of course, the problem is they, the market won't invest in anything um, um, north of the M4 corridor. So literally, if you want to go from uh, Cardiff to... Uh, North Wales up the um, A470, you, you only had the choice of two chargers, and that's it. Yeah. And there's still, I, mm. there, I think there's some old ecotricity units which I've seen no intention from GridServe of upgrading, um, you know, Mid Wales and North Wales as well. From, I think they were installed by the EU uh, several years ago. Um, that I haven't seen any intention on GridServe's website to upgrade those single charges in those remote areas that were put there by the EU. Hopefully that will change. Hopefully it will. Well, I think we've um, we've really um, made use of the time this evening. We've perhaps overrun the hour that's maybe suggested at the start of the things. Uh, but thanks very much for your contribution. I think Everybody on the podcast uh, to, has had an opportunity to hear a lot about the the new model ZS and uh, its benefits. It's a shame we can't order them yet, Miles. But there you go. That's uh, that's the reality it's, it's of the situation. Success, unfortunately, and it's it, I guess it's a first world problem, isn't it? Um, but uh, yeah. So um, thanks very much for joining everybody. So, but before we go. Um, if you're interested in the Aura Electric, which is an, an alternative there to, to look at, the Aura Electric cars and the Aura Cat, which is hopefully coming soon to the uh, UK, sign up at the AuraEVs.com, our sister forum, and uh, get involved in the conversation there. Uh, so that's it for our um, podcast, uh, for the MG EV podcast this week. And my thanks uh, go to uh, Jake Newis, uh, to Vince Williams. Thank you. Uh, Michael Fisher. Evening, all. 
Thanks all. And of course, Miles Roberts from the Cholly Group. Thanks all. Cheers. And from me. So Barry Hager, Barry H on the forum. So uh, we'll be back um, shortly with another MG podcast. So please click all the likes and subscribe so you can be notified for the next podcast. So we really appreciate your participation and comments and questions on the podcast. So thanks again and good night. And we hope to see you on the next podcast soon. Good night. Good night.